the 77 percent is back in Accra, the capital of Ghana. And it is here that the government has embarked on an ambitious digitalization agenda. But what does it mean for young people and their future? Let's find out. Today we're going to be asking the question, can digitalization spur Africa? What is digitalization to begin with? Well, luckily for me, I have a really cool group of people who are going to explain all the details, the challenges, and possibly how Africa can overcome those challenges. And the first question is going to go to a man who's been described as a Mark Zuckerberg for Africa. Uh, well, he's shaking his head. You really don't like that. <laughs> no, we'll, no, we'll get no. to that shortly. But yes. um, briefly, if you can, what is digitalization? Digitalization is um, using technology-driven uh, solutions to enhance businesses. So it's more of using business processes, uh, using technology to enhance business processes so you realize that digitalization is, is very much you know disrupting uh, the space in Africa and creating jobs creating opportunities bringing transparency so it's a good thing you know we are digitalizing a lot of our processes in Africa but Nadia I want to ask you because you're a digital marketer but you're also teaching people digital literacy are we prepared for this kind of technology on the continent Okay, I think it's because it's new, it's going to start and people are going to have their backsides. People are going to backlash about stuff like this because everything that comes into Africa, people are ready to fight against it and adopt it. But it will take some time for people to actually understand what they are trying to do, adapt it and maybe head on to it. So it will take some time. All right, I want to bring in Wilbur Fosasari who is actually a human rights activist, not a person you would expect to find on a conversation about digitaliz digitalization. Oh, this word, we're going to be stumbling all over today <laughs> but you say that mm -mm, there needs to be a conversation about what we are doing to our society particularly with children absolutely and I'm advocating that technology is good we can't do anything about it digitalization is good we need it for business development but the excesses it has created is negatively impacting on our children when it comes to uh, pornography when it comes to all other vices that are having uh, impact on children. And so the developers of the technology now must come up with measures that will be used in protecting our children so that while we are advancing business, we don't um, kill the next generation because they will not come and inherit all the business um, arguments that would have made because they will no longer be there. So let's make provision to protect our children. Okay, well, how do you react to that, uh, Prince? We're being told that innovation could be a problem, could be dangerous, particularly to children. Um, yes and no, because um, with, again, from the game's perspective, if you look at the bulk of the people who play these mobile games, you find out that they are children and Although there are systems put in place to prevent you know, this kind of negative sites like this pornography sites, parents can install like ad blocks and pop-ups and all that to prevent pop-ups and all that. So yes and no because yes you can prevent that and no and no because the bulk of the, 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 bulk of the people playing mobile games are also children. So it's, it's, it's like there's a balance over there. And with innovation, yes um, with Africa for instance, when the innovation is too di um, disruptive, we are not really prepared for it because one, um, there is no inf infrastructure to make it sustainable, mm -hmm. and two, the environment and also the people, um, their digital maturity, and that's why we need people like Nadia to you know um, train them in the in digital skills because you can have um, all the disruptive technology like um, all the digital fintechs, but a woman in a, in a village doesn't have access to the internet to actually make that, um, you know, transaction. So, so the, 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 there is a disconnect over there. Okay. I want to bring in someone who actually works for the banking sector. We're talking about a digital revolution, but of course it needs financing. Are Africans serious about putting their money where their mouth is? Um, I don't think it's about where we put our money. Huh? I think that once you create an idea, most of the time you're looking straight to a financier. But maybe you need a track record to show that you have provided this particular idea to about six or ten people. And then they are paying you some peanuts, but there's a, a certain ability to scale up. Then you can approach a bank and then a financial institution can actually give you support. But the unfortunate thing is that, um, like you said, is the market ready? Are we ready? Do they have 
the, the platforms that can actually help you scale up and all that. Um, so, uh, uh, okay, whoa, well, Maximus, yeah, you have I think the, the issue we have in Ghana about funding is that the cost of money is quite expensive. Yeah. If you go to bank for a loan, it's about 26%. Interest right? rate? Yeah, interest rate. And a young person have, having an idea, going to a financial institution and they're asking you to pay 26% mm -hmm. and you have no financial records, right? So it's quite difficult right here in Ghana, you know, uh, developing an idea or even scaling it. Let me come to the boss here. As, as he's been, no, no, no. As, <laughs> you've obviously yeah. been running a company that has multiple platforms for a while. Yeah. Yeah. But to what extent does financing curtail development and scaling? The reason why the funding is helping out to scale up your business, okay. you know, when you're starting out, you the entrepreneur, you might be skilled in just one uh, area and you need to invest into human resource. You need somebody to focus on business management and things like that. That's why I believe investment and, you know, uh, uh, supporting startups come in because we need the experts around us. We are just visionaries. We need people to invest uh, into it. And uh, you mentioned the thing about access mm -hmm. that I believe, you know, a lot of people are thinking building mobile apps is the thing. but you know, not everybody is literate enough to use a mobile application. So you have to look at areas and do proper research and look for what will work for them. You know, so... Uh, yeah, so let me come back to you, Nadia, because you were talking about digital literacy. So when a person like Randolph or Prince here develops something disruptive, are we able to consume it in the way that it has been designed? Um, thinking about what you've talked about, you've mentioned access. I think they, they are mostly focused on millennials, just like Prince said. Women are not open to internet. Women are not getting the full potential of the internet and digitalization. Why is that? Because of the know-how. How many women are we training to know how to use the technology we are boasting and bragging about? How many women in the rural areas are actually knowing what is happening on the World Wide Web? It's very less. Because these women are not having the technical know-how and they are not even having the access they are not even educated enough to even know how to use the internet. Most women who use technology is mostly to connect with their families, connect with social media platforms, and interact with their family members. But at a broader number of women using technology, just like the men are boasting about how to digitize things, make money easy and all of that, are women actually getting the access? I think this is not much wide spoken about mm -hmm. because they are targeting people who already are on the internet to make big things happen. Okay, and I'd actually like to point out that of all our panelists here today, Nadia is actually the only woman who we have and it's not for a lack of trying. Uh, but coming back to you, Prince, because you're the one who said that, you know, we're creating this for people who already understand the language. We're speaking to people who are already on the same wavelength as us. But how do you have this digitalization revolution when you are isolating the bulk of the population, particularly now in this case as it was raised women? Yeah, um, I think this ties into, uh, let's say, like a, a catalyst. When you're starting something, uh, and you have like people who are first going to take it on before you're able to you know, catalyze and then scale it up, just like in business. So, moving forward, with, with people like Nadia, when they, you know, also do their job well, and then train <laughs> more people, then we can have people on board. I want to come back to Nadia here for one second, um, and then I'll come to you. Uh, in an ideal space where we have all the technology that we need, how do we begin the process of teaching people how to use this very complex um, softwares or programs when they don't even have access to electricity? It's, it's a tough question because most people that are not benefiting from social media, the internet, World Wide Web is because of all these um, climaxes, it's because of all these pauses, because they don't have internet, they don't have electricity, they don't have smartphones, mm -hmm. they don't even have education enough. So I think it's more of everyone stepping in to do their jobs, NGOs, civil societies, individuals, private sectors, the government. It's a collective effort. We need a collective effort to do this. And I know some businesses are actually scouting out for this. I know World Wide Foundation is doing this. So many um, businesses are out there trying to create access, trying to create communities, mm. communication communities where people don't have internet. They are trying to create communities where these people can also access to offline information to be part of the online world. So I think it's a collective effort. We, we can start now, but it's up to all of us to put our strengths together to be able to reach this goal. Okay, Nadia, that's very interesting. So in an ideal world, say everything works perfectly, people do what they're meant to do, we have the investors, we have the programmers. Um, you're saying that there's a bigger problem here that we should be looking at, digital colonialism. What is that? 
Yeah, so digital colonialism is the concept where a virtual company or a, a, a technology company, you know, takes over people or net, uh, what they call data subjects. So people who use internet in a particular country, they have their data on their system and they regulate it using their terms of agreement and policy. Mm -hmm. And they don't have uh, an umbrella regulation from the local uh, government. So what they are doing now is that they are building colonies in countries where they have virtual presence. And most of them are not being regulated as they, they need to. So, for example, somebody is using Facebook in Ghana, his data is in, uh, what call in the USA and Ghana has no control. And if government wants to regulate face fake news, how do they do that? They have to go back to Facebook. Facebook has to tell them how the algorithm works and how they must follow their own system before they regulate that. So it's quite difficult if we don't have regulation governing that space so that we have our data sovereignty and virtual sovereignty protected and then we interdepend on those uh, companies as well. You're not, you're not agreeing with this? Yeah, so um, <laughs> my take on this is, so I, I run a company called BISA and we are connecting patients to doctors. So you find in 2014, a lot of people died during the Ebola crisis and you have CDC at the forefront of uh, an epidemic like that when they had a lot of data. So you see at this point, at BISA, you know, we are collating a lot of data. This is something that, um, looking at their experience, we can collaborate with them and get a lot of learning. So if they are very highly regulated, then it means collaboration in this forefront, because healthcare is a very important space in Africa. And, you know, data is now key when it comes to, you know, uh, curbing certain epidemics. So I believe there should be a lot of uh, conversation and stakeholder meetings that should go into this before decisions are made because it could be a two-edged sword. But looking forward, coming back to the original question, can digitalization spur Africa? I want to bring in this student here because he's obviously one of the millennials and he's been looking for a job in the IT sector. So we're saying this is good for the continent, but it seems there's no space for people like you. The companies, they actually, um, for the... What they have is like, most of them have everything, like they mostly have everything set. So you come in and they don't actually have a problem. Uh -huh. But then what they'll do is, let's say one person will be handling maybe two jobs. So one person who is supposed to um, handle, let's say the back end will be doing um, UI, user yeah. interface. Yeah. It's, it's like just one person. So he's taking up uh, the job of someone um, else's. Yeah. So we should have like someone doing UI and someone doing back end. Yeah. Um. Yeah, 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 and I think please, please um, move closer. I think that's uh, actually the very uh, like uh, traditional uh, companies, but it's changing very fast, as you say, in separation. So, like some of us in the gaming industry now, what we are doing is creating more jobs um, with possibility. To uh, with other possibilities, other titles. So, uh, for instance, what I tell people is when tech and creative arts come together, mm -hmm. more opportunities, more jobs are created. So, what games or what the gaming industry provides for an economy, a creative e economy like Africa, mm -hmm. is more jobs. So, there's a whole possibility of what digital brings to a space and we just have to be brave enough to dive into the sectors and we are seeing all those things we have robotics springing we have gaming springing we have um, <laughs> um, mixed reality vr companies springing up so we have to expand the space to be able to absorb um, these students coming up. So but, um, you know, we've been talking briefly about how prepared Africa is. You talked yep. about robotics. Yep. I think the continent is spending the least amount of money compared to the rest of the world yes. on robotics and yep. also artificial intelligence. Yep. So how do we bridge that gap? Start. So some of us are first movers in the gaming space and we've been doing this and we believe that gaming, uh, game development is in line with the robotics. Um, it's in line, like they are all new media, new digital spaces that, um, or new, I call them new industries mm. that are springing up. Okay. And we believe it's the only industry that will catapult Africa to be at par with the West. Okay, that's something really interesting you're saying because it sounds to me like digitalization is now emerging as a silver bullet, the thing that will cure all. But we heard this before about manufacturing and it didn't work. Are we setting ourselves up for failure, Maximus? You see, that's the challenge we have, you know. So there's a concept called digital, so the, how you blend physical and digital together. So if you have been doing e-commerce, for example, what product are you selling? Are they locally manufactured products or you are just building shelves for Chinese products or American products in Ghana? 
right? So if you don't build an industrialization base where you manufacture local products, e-commerce is going to drive somebody else's industry because they're going to sell their products in your country. So that's a challenge that we're going to have. Mm -hmm. And we need to get the physical infrastructure things set up. We need to have local industries, you know, functioning and producing uh, dresses, shoes, bags, cars, and all that we need so that when you put the virtual market on it, then the e-commerce can be profitable to us than the, the digital colonial. <laughs> <laughs> like yeah, of course. I think one thing that uh, the digitalization does is that um, it keeps corruption. It takes away the middleman. I mean, we don't necessarily need too many NAAs to operate in the, uh, in the digital world. So uh, one, two of the problems that have really affected Africa's development is uh, unemployment and then corruption. So when we introduce more digital jobs, we are taking away the middleman and then we are operating face-to-face -face with businesses or with the customers. That way we are curbing corruption. And it's, it's, it gives us more opportunity to grow because with, uh, with a young person like this, you know, the challenge is that there's no entry point or there are very little entry point. Okay, okay. Um, and looking at that conversely, so opportunities for a man like this one would potentially mean, as you say, job losses for other people. What do we do with them? Job losses is going to come because AI is on its way and trust me, once AI sets in, job losses are going to come. It's all about how we prepare ourselves. The industry is an industry educated enough to be ready for AI because very soon healthcare, as he's talking about, is going to be handled by AI. Education, shipping, most of these areas are going to be handled by AI. As a country, as a continent, how prepared are we to handle uh, artificial intelligence managing people? Uh, let me ask you that question. How prepared we are, are not. We? <laughs> we are not. <laughs> yeah. You know, because you know, AI has its pros and cons. But one of one of the good sides of AI is that it gets things done faster. Okay. Um, I want to come back to you, Prince, because you have something to say. Yeah. Um, everyone is like asking questions, but they're not really put like setting. You know. So give us the answers. Exactly. Give us the answers. Exactly. <laughs> With how prepared we are, to be very honest. You don't answer that question. It is the journey to answer that question that you move towards digitalization. Mm -hmm. You have to start something first. With what you mentioned about uh, manufacturing, manufacturing did its part in the second revolution and the third revolution. And now we are at um, Industry 4.0, which is being pioneered by digitalization. We are monitoring, you know, um, pumps and then, in, uh, you know, machines real time. And we're using that data to make proactive decisions. So we are no longer reactive. Okay, um, so let me come back to you, Wilberforce. I haven't forgotten you. When you look at the landscape of Africa in, say, the next 10 years, given how rapidly technology evolves, do you feel secure that your dream to protect children while also evolving is going to work? Marching on with the uh, victories that technology are going to bring to Africa is embedded in it the need to make sure that we secure the borders of the lives of our children because they need to grow up and come and take over these technologies that we are creating now. If they do not grow up properly to come and take it over from us and probably even develop it further than we have, then all the efforts that all these technology giants put in has come to naught. Or for that matter, the technology giants need to put in place adequate measures to ensure that children are protected so they can grow up and inherit the technologies that they are developing. I don't know if you can see Prince shaking his head so hard. <laughs> yeah, I think, it's, I think it's, it's, about, it's about perspective. Mm -hmm. And with job security, it depends on the kind of job. You can change your perspective and then instead of you being afraid that AI will come and take over your job, why don't you be the person who's developing the AI? One, one uh, you know, upside of technology is connectivity. You can be at work and be able to call your children real time. But it also makes us very insular. You're on your phone with your head down. I think we all know, yeah, it's, the dangers it's, it's, of that. It's, 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 you know, there's two ways to it, but um, I'm trying to focus on the good side right now, where I can connect to someone, uh, you know, who is miles away. And also, what if um, you, are, you are able to, you know, train your children for them to also be tech, 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 technology savvy, mm -hmm. not necessarily come and inherit what you are trying to create. Okay, yes. well... Oh, 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 okay. <laughs> Just like the alcohol industry, do you have, for, for example, your, your games, do you have some uh, requirement or maybe play responsibly. Um, so yes, you have those guidelines. Yeah, yeah, but even adults get addic uh, addicted, addicted to technology. Yeah. No you know, so there are digital you know, addiction issues that must be dealt with. Can you imagine if your phone, on a, on a charge, you can use it for a month, 
we will all fall off because we'll be, we'll be on the phone 24 hours, right? So let's be responsible when you're developing the technology and using it. We shouldn't lose our culture, our the physical identity to a virtual presence or a virtual uh, identity we are trying to create for ourselves. So it's very important. Okay, uh, one second. He just had one thing to add. And to add to that, um, technology is not like replacing us because, y you know, AI will start writing the codes. But the creative sides cannot be replaced. That's where people can grow innovative to manage the machines. So work, a lot of work will move towards the soft skills. And when that happens, we are going to now call on the policy maker. I want to get one more comment because uh, oh, we are never going to end this debate. I disagree with him when it comes to the issue about policy. The, 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 the thing about development is that development goes hand in hand. While you are developing, you, uh, and, uh, when I, okay, I'll explain that. I, what I'm saying is that development does, is not mutually exclusive from policy. Mm -hmm. So when you are developing, you are also putting in place policies to govern the development. We will not say that, okay, let's Develop. leave regulation. Let's do whatever we are doing. When we hit, then we come and do the amendments. Yeah. So let's put up the American Constitution and then when we think that there's a problem, let's come up with the First Amendment, Second Amendment, Third Amendment. You might have created major problems before you come and do those amendments. So my argument is that whilst you are introducing the technology, sit back and make sure that you are introducing policy to protect children, to protect the next generation. Let's just not think about the provisions for satisfying business provisions now. Let's satisfy the business, but let's make policy that will protect Okay. the future all right uh wilberforce i'm being uh, tapped from here i'm not sure i, I think uh, the, what, the what, what he wants to say is probably that he being wilberforce yeah 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 mm -hmm. although he's he's focused entirely on children but we need to you know localize if you are bringing in technology it's not like a, a one size fits all for africa you need to see what you know satisfies a specific need first mm -hmm. and this can be in ghana this can be in you know ethiopia this can be in kenya any country so when you do that first before you can actually you know scale it and although we are focused on the children but um, digitalization is more about disrupting it and you know boosting the economy and the economy actually, you know, benefits children one way or the other. So well, it's not necessarily said, about... What we have said here... Yes. yes, but what we have said here is not an issue about digitalization. We are saying digitalization is good because it is for improving, of improving business. Certainly. But we are saying that the repercussions, the excesses that digitalization has brought on children, on the moral fiber, that is what we are, we are complaining about. So we are not saying that digitalization is not bad. We agree that the focus of digitalize, as you explained from the beginning, yeah. is that it is for business enhancement. Yes. And we agree with that. There's no problem. But the excesses of it, all the social media vices that's brought, all the other aspects of it that has come, that is having a ne And this negative effect is not only on children. Yeah. It's also on adults. There are yes. adults who are bullied on social media, Fine. bullied on, on, on yeah. Facebook and all that. So I'm saying that the excesses, we need to introduce policy to make sure that we got it. Let's not say, let's fold our arms. No. Let's digitize. And then afterwards, we think about the repercussions. Okay, um, I'm, going to take, I'm going to take one more point. So, yeah, so that we... we <laughs> that's not, um, actually, I don't even have words now. You, that's not what we are saying. We are not saying that you have to fold your arms whilst you watch us build. But the thing is, you can't introduce policy at the moment where I'm building and expect me like to pay you. Though it's good for you to, um, to study it, right? But I wouldn't um, pay you money to come and start introducing policy in something that we've not tested in the space before we start putting in the right measures. But sometimes so, you even need policies to regulate how you're testing. No, no, yes. During the testing phase, then you can inform them because it's a gradual process. You first innovate, you see how people interact before you put in those measures. And I'm very glad that you are, like your institution is there, 
focusing on putting in those measures. But it doesn't mean that we are not conscious of it. Um, okay, I, I have to step in here because there are a lot of tall men who are <laughs> shouting all around me. I think what's pretty clear is that the conversation on regulation and policy is one that could take years. And I think very clearly what it has taught us is that we still have a long way to go. Uh, but finally, I want to come to you, Randolph. In spite of everything that we've spoken about today, the fourth industrial revolution, is Africa prepared and does the future look good for us? No, the future looks good for, for us. I think we are ready for it, but we should also not forget the large informal sector because they are very much important. So let's see how we can include them by training. And as well, when we are building technologies as innovators, let's solve problems and let's not focus uh, our attention too much on the problems. Let's just solve the problems. Well, thank you very much. I have to say it's been a very exciting debate. I wish we had more time. And I'm obviously feeling like this is a chicken and egg situation. I'm not sure if it's humanity first and technology later or the other way around. But in any case, Thank you for watching.